Uh oh. I know what happened. I know what happened. No, I didn't look at him. Look at him. Okay. From last week's mess to a new perspective, Jesus asks, who do you say I am? And then on that mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, a moment of wonderment, a moment of clarification. This is my beloved, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. As we come, as we come, as we prepare to listen, come as we get ready to see anew, come as we worship. Beloveds, welcome to worship at Emmanuel. We hope that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you find a welcome and a community here. <sighs> Friends, will you stand as you are able, in body or in heart, for our call to worship. It is good for us to be here. Yes, oh God. Let us worship God together in word and song. Sing to Jesus, Son of the Beloved. It is good for us to be here. We will live in the house of God. Let us pray. Holy God, you reveal yourself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Yet he and you remain a mystery. Invite us into that mystery drawing us into relationship, calling us back to you better each day, walking side by side through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together. So, we have a new song, guys. I'm going to show you your part. We sing this chorus twice, and then we have like a middle section, a solo that you do not have to sing in, and then we're going to sing this chorus um, I think twice again. Okay, so this is your part. Transfigure me so that I might be more like Jesus. More like Jesus. Transfigure me so that I might be more like Jesus. What you like. Transfigure me so that I might be more like Jesus, more like Jesus. Transfigure me so that I might be more like Jesus, Jesus, my light. Awesome. Good job, guys. Okay, I'll hit it.
Friends, we come before God and we in another in a moment of honesty, knowing that we have not always lived up to the love that we hope to share in the world or we are called to. Will you join me in our prayer of confession? Guiding God, we have failed to follow you as we ought. We have not reached out to our neighbors with the selflessness, sacrificial love you modeled for us. We have caused harm to others and your creation by our actions and our unwillingness to act. Forgive us our sins and lead us back into the path you have trod for the sake of others. Beloveds, hear the good news. In Christ, God meets us where we are and as we are, and for his sake, God makes us whole and holy Go forth and follow Jesus in the knowledge that your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. As people reconcile to God and to one another, let us share signs of peace with one another. Peace be with you. Then you may be seated. I think I'm going, am I going up now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, forgot to grab the program. So um, we're starting a unit on disciples in Sunday school. So uh, I thought it would be a great lesson both for the kids and for all of us to do a little demonstration, little type of thing. Uh, could I have Ms. Nora to come to the front for a second? You won't have to do anything. So we are going to these, we have sticky notes and the sticky notes represent uh, knowledge of God, knowing that God loves us, things like that. At least uh, way back in the old days, not everyone knew that. Uh, now a lot of people know about God. They just may not be convinced uh, due to uh, sometimes his own followers would dissuade people from wanting to be Christian or you know, going through a tragedy in your life. So think of, you know, giving or giving help, possibly, might make clear that the love and the work of God is still active today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to announce each round, and we're going to start with Nora. And right now, she is the only one that's aware of the love of God. However, why don't you go to someone else? Anyone? and give her half your sticky notes. And now you just hold your sticky notes up. There are two people that know the love of God. And so we are going to go on. Okay, so one of you need to go, how about Jack? How about you go to your mom? And she can give you half of her sticky notes and Nora can go to someone else. Give half the sticky notes. How many people know the love of God now? Move on to someone else. Keep sharing. <laughs> All right, keep going. So let's have hands up. How many people know the love of God now? How many people have sticky notes? Hold your notes up. We're getting there. Uh, you can borrow some 
If you received a sticky note, search someone out who needs to receive the love of God. Okay, does anyone do, does not know the love of God yet? We know you do. It's just for an example. Anyone does not know the love of God yet? Anyone left? Maybe one person up here. <laughs> wow! So it's to prove that uh, we have, one reason we have a church community is so we don't have to live our life alone. We don't we don't have to be alone in what we're trying to accomplish. We have a set group of people to help us. Jesus didn't do it alone. He had his 12 disciples. And it's important to have a community and a group and know that we don't have to do everything alone. So thank you all very much, my fellow people who know the love of God. Okay, if we could get some help, we need to move the food into the fellowship hall so that we can count. Anyone who wants to help is welcome. Set them down. What I've learned in church so far, if you know the love of God, post it. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Listen for the word of God. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God, that, that the kingdom of God has come with power. 
Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious, loving. God, may our thoughts and our reflections be a blessing today and always and every day. Amen. I just want to go back again to this. And we talked about in Bible study, like, who doesn't know that one person when they have no idea what to say? Like, they just say everything. Peter is wild. Peter is a wild character. He's a lot to say for not knowing what to say. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Friends, happy transfiguration. I think, I think when we look at transfiguration, it's often held as a proof of Jesus' divinity. Because look, he's all shiny. And I imagine the first hearers of the story would have thought of Moses who went up the mountain, met God, and came back down the mountain with rays shining out from him. It makes for some really entertaining artwork over the centuries. But most of the time, I'm a little loud today, most of the time when we come together to tell this story on a Sunday morning, we just have the story ooh, of Jesus and the transfiguration, the part where they go up the mountain, meet Moses and Elijah, and then talk about the tents. Can we turn me down a little bit? Just a, just a bit. Oh, I lost my little thing. That's what happened. It's a rough day. All right. Where was I? Anyway. So we have all these other stories this morning that might seem like they're completely unrelated. And we could follow Peter from the beginning where he gets the right answer but doesn't seem to understand the definition of the answer he gives. He doesn't seem to understand what it means to be Messiah. Perhaps because the definition Jesus is trying to give them is not the one that any other Jewish community at the time would have imagined. Not one would have thought it would involve the Messiah would suffer and be killed. It didn't make sense to those who believed that the Messiah was coming to establish God's image of the world on earth, whether it's militarily or it's political or it's spiritual. Not one of those images meant that the Messiah would die. And I imagine that when Jesus started to explain what would happen to him as the Messiah, Peter's mind went completely blank because he just doesn't know what to say. And he might not have heard the part about where Jesus said he would rise again on the third day. And even if he had heard it, would he have understood what it meant? For Peter, for Jesus, for all of them, it had been a hard bunch of days. They had just learned the news that John the baptizer, the one who had prepared the way for the one who comes in the name of the Lord, had been executed by Herod. And there were probably some former followers of John amongst the people of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus. 
The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus and John were about were of the same age and were cousins. It was probably a really hard couple of weeks. And Jesus knows everything is about to change. The anonymity and the comfort of being in the Galilee region was about to be lost as soon as they entered the city of Jerusalem. Jesus' conversations with the religious leaders were going to find themselves more pointed and less friendly than they had been. And knowing what had happened to John, someone who upset the powerful, Jesus had to assume and know that when he shows up, the path he was going to continue down might lead and would probably lead to the same results. But I think Jesus' answer to Peter sounds real aggressive, right? To get behind me, Satan. And maybe it was then. But of course, their concept, our concept of Satan and their concept of Satan at the time were not the same thing. It takes us hundreds of years to get to how we understand Satan today. It was mostly as one who tempts another or an adversary. Mark doesn't give us a clear description of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, but we see here how Peter might have been like one of those temptations that are described elsewhere, where the tempter in the wilderness said that, Jesus, you could just claim your power. Just claim your power. You don't need to go through all this. You don't have to go through it. Just claim your power. Rule the nations. And I imagine that if Jesus had let himself go there, if he had let those words of Peter go through his head, he might have thought it sounded really nice. To not have to go through all of the pain that was about to happen. When Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, what he's really saying is, you who are tempting me, find your place. Line up. Get on board. You're not leading this caravan. Follow. You're not in charge here. Literally, get in line with me. Follow me. And when he says, if you want to be my follower, it is not about the things that you want. It is not about putting yourself at the center. It's about denying yourself, but not in a way where you um, live this minimalized aesthetic life but it's about not centering yourself, to get in line and to center God, to have God sent as the center, God's vision as the center, that you might love your neighbor and yourself and all of creation. But if you center yourself, if you claim your life as the first priority, you will never find fulfillment. You will always never have enough wealth. You will Never, their job will never be enough. The things that you claim for yourself will never fulfill. But if you center God and you center the kingdom of God, when you center God's vision of the world, it points you back to loving your neighbor and loving yourself and caring for creation is that is how we enter into fulfillment and abundance. And it's going to be hard. And when you do it right, when you love the world correctly, Jesus says to his followers then and probably to us today and all of the ones in between, when you do it right, the powers of the world would prefer that you don't. And it might have a cost. And it cost John his life. And it cost Jesus his life. And executed by the state who revealed its greatest power was violence and death. And we see it in the prophets throughout the ages since. But this isn't always the context we have when we come to transfiguration. You know, it's often in isolation. But this is the context, not in isolation, not independent happening with his disciples. And Peter and James and John get to go up to the mountain with Jesus. And they get to have this amazing moment 
which must have seemed to them that Jesus was a little confusing because like you just talked about how it's very human and you're going to die and now you're very shiny and you're talking with these dead prophets like this doesn't make sense, Jesus. So I guess what I never wondered before is why? Why now? Why with these three? Why did Jesus need this moment? Peter offers to build them tents, like a tent of, might be a tent of worship like the tabernacle when the Hebrew people were wandering in the wilderness. Or it might be the tents that people lived in when they were wandering in the wilderness. Or it could be talking about tents or booths that people built in fields when it was time for harvest and it was urgent. There was an urgency attached to the farming and they needed a place to stop and to rest and to get out of the sun and to snack. Today, there is still a Jewish holiday that comes after the high holy days, after they have spent a month in lamentation, where they build a booth and they gather with friends and they eat in their tent and they spend time outside and they gather together to celebrate, to be together. So what if this moment wasn't first and foremost a gift to Peter and James and John? What if this moment on the top of the mountain was a gift for Jesus? What if his experience of going to the mountain and hanging out with Moses and Elijah was like hanging out with two friends? A chance for encouragement for the days to come, to get out for the dark days, that there was going to be a sense of urgency that was going to come, but here and now they could pause, they could talk, they could tell stories. What was to come was going to be filled with hurt. Maybe in this moment, talking with Moses and Elijah, and we don't get to hear what they say, so we get to make it up. It was a conversation that some of encouragement like, you got this, Jesus. You're not going to be alone. Because Moses and Elijah certainly felt alone from time to time. And they certainly felt abandoned by God from time to time. What if this was a moment of strengthening for Jesus? For what was to come? As much for him as it had been for the disciples. And I get it. The desire to stay up there makes a lot of sense to me. I've had experiences of the divine touching earth when I was a young person at church camp with folks who even now gather together when one of us is in need. And if I could capture those, if I could have captured those moments long ago and stayed in them forever, I would have, but you can't. Life happens everywhere else. And it's not like we don't have interactions with the divine throughout our days and our weeks here on this level or a valley level or the hills, the occasional mountains we have to climb. But I wonder if one of the lessons of transfiguration is not so much about shiny Jesus but that at those moments when you need encouragement to gather with your community and you get to be real and you get to be honest and you get to hear and you get to tell stories and you get strengthened by your community and by love. There are rare supernatural mountaintop experiences we're lucky if we get one in a lifetime. But maybe what's more important is seeing the shine on each other's faces, the glow when someone falls in love, the glow when someone gets to be their full and complete and imperfect self, when communities gather to care for each other, 
when individuals are held as beloved and then welcomed into the beloved community. When we line ourselves with the things of God and the vision of God, and when that becomes central and sends us into the broken world as it is to love our neighbor and ourselves and all of creation. So what if this space and this time every week, other times during the week, or beyond the doors when we gather with friends is a chance to be on the mountaintop, to gather with friends, to be real honest, to tell our stories, to share our hearts, and to prepare for the struggles and the pain and the difficult days outside those doors? What if this is our mountaintop where we find rest and community and friends before we go into the world? And then we who have found a place, who have found a place get to go into the world and be that shining face and build community around us. We get to be the safe and the mountain play top place for those in the world, a shining presence of God's love on post-it note or otherwise, shining love to the world. Amen. Beloveds, will you stand for our hymn, an invitation? Thank you. 
part of how we live and care for each other in this community is to hold each other, the church universal, our community, and the world in prayer. Um, our congregational prayers this week are for are for the Sandys, uh, Sandy Horn and Sandy and Greg Jarrett. Um, this week we are celebrating a whole bunch of birthdays. Uh, Kelvin Hazelberg is turning 12. Uh, also this turning 12 this week are um, Arwen and Kerwin Stackvon, Hezzy, Hezzy, Peggy Hazelberg, myself, and John Louie. Happy birthday. I never would put myself on the list, but there it is. I'm not in charge of the list. <laughs> uh, Mary Branson is recovering from knee surgery she had on Monday. She's doing the things she has to do to, to heal, but, you know, it's going to take some time. Um, we're also holding in prayer Lori Bucket, Julia Starbuck going for surgery on the 19th. She must have wandered down the hall. Um, Dan Milos's mother and family, uh, my sister Jessica, Fran Pike, Connie's friend Jimmy, Francine's friend Karen, Donna's friend Jessica, uh, Ken and Fran Pike's son Brad and his family, Charlotte, uh, Leah's friend Sandy, Sandy Horn's sister Gail, Jeannie's friend Dixie Dixon, and cousin John Patrick, and Steve Thompson's friend Carl. Are there others we're holding in prayer this morning? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, refugees. Uh, the, there's so there's so many so many and so many different places um, for mul multitudes of reasons we have continued to hold in prayer those who have been um, suffering under violence um, in Gaza in um, Ukraine um, somewhere in Africa who's better at this this morning is it Sudan again? It, I mean, is it always Sudan, which is real sad, but um, so there are places all over the world. Um, we hold those with those who are living in the midst of and under the threat of violence. For all of those living with and loving and caring for those with uh, addiction or mental illness. Uh, for our kids and our teachers. Things are hard. Our teachers are having a hard time. Our kids can have a hard time. All right. Well, we carry all of those that we have said and we have left unsaid in prayer. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, descend on us. Break us, mold us, and fill us with your imagination, your energy, and your wisdom. Let us see through your eyes. Let us be seen as those who are changed by faith, as those who by our words and actions are known to be a people who are focused on improving the world we live in for the benefit of all. Especially today, we pray for those in need of transformation in their lives so badly. Those who climb the mountain of hope every day and yet return to the reality of their lives with no apparent sign that things are ever will ever get better. We pray for the hungry, the sick, the homeless and the unemployed. Daily such people must long for an easing of their circumstance, 
Make known to us, Lord, the people and the circumstances that we might extend the hand of comfort and share your love with people in need. We pray for the bereaved and the lonely, for those whose lives have fallen apart as a result of changing circumstances. Daily, such people must long for companionship and for easing of anxieties brought on by a sense of aloneness and a lack of solidarity in life. Bring into our lives the people and the opportunities that we might befriend the lonely and give companionship to those who walk such a challenging path. Gracious God, we each long for signs that you are present that you and you are special. It is so much easier to live the life of faith when we have a strong sense of your glory. We ask that you keep revealing yourself to us in small ways as well as more dramatic ways in order that we might continue to live in astonishment and amazement and serve you fully. We pray all this in the name of the one Jesus who taught his disciples and us to pray to you, God, who is our mother and our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have heard the word, we have reflected, we have received some of what God has to offer. And so we have a moment to offer back to God. Our offering is being collected in the back. Our singing bowl uh, is continuing to support the work of the Trevor Project, a leading um, suicide and prevention and crisis intervention nonprofit for LGBT youth, uh, providing 24 our support all year uh, for young people in the midst of crisis. Um, some announcements. You can't smell it right now, but if those doors were open, you could smell it, ham. It's coffee hour day, and so we invite you, join us. Invite down the hall over yonder. Um, some meetings, the trustees, Bible study. Uh, Thursday's the deadline for newsletter articles for March and council will meet next Sunday after worship. Um, hey, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We changed our mind at the last minute. We're gonna do a service. Come join us Ash Wednesday at six o'clock. We'll be right here. Uh, if, if that is too late for you, I understand friends. Sometimes life is hard. If you want to stop by during the day and receive ashes, we can do that. Um, but we will have a service here at 6 o'clock um, as we prepare our hearts and our time of our season of Lent together. Um, yes, we do have, and you will receive on your way out, a My Lent calendar, a little challenge, a daily challenge for your Lent season. Uh, good fun challenges like smile at someone today. Um, there are, you'll see, um, we are doing a, a group read here at the church. 
uh, with this Adam Grant book, Think Again. Uh, it is an invitation to consider the things that you don't know. What we're planning, it's between myself and Mother Pippa over yonder at the Episcopal Church, that in the spring, we are going to offer this to the community. Uh, Dousman is a good community with good people or the beyond Dousman. I'm sure they're good people too. Um, um, but as an offering of entering into this, uh, what may be a difficult political season, how can we um, engage each other well and build community, build connection with each other? And so uh, we'll be making that happen. But this is an opportunity. We want members of our churches to be kind of leaders. We're going to have a little group to lead discussions. And so part of that is coming and joining us um, on those first few nights. Um, we are still doing our stone soup. You'll see a few things back over yonder. Next week on Sunday, it is who do you love? We'll invite you to bring um, things that represent who or what you love. Also, if you have Valentine's Day decorations, before you put them away, bring them. There's also on the rotation, um, just a little reminder that the United Church of Christ camps are beginning to uh, take signups. If there's a camp, if your kids are interested in a week of camp, if your grandkids, if you are interested in a week of um, or a couple of days of camp of some sort, family camp, youth camps. And then in West Bend, it'll be the next one, uh, at Cedar Valley it does a weekend, either three day or one day, like art retreats. So this is one example, but they have lots of opportunities. Um, if you're like, I want to go watercolor for a weekend, which sounds awesome, by the way. There are opportunities, there are scholarship funds available, both from this congregation, from the church here, and then the broader area and the conference. So it, it, it makes things a little, a little easier. Don't forget to look at the ways to sign up and be involved. And I have an announcement. Um, we would like to get- like, You need to speak into your microphone. We'd like to get a choir going. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, good. And probably just have one, yeah, like service now. Um, so one song, we're thinking of doing it in maybe like the first or second week of March. So if anyone is interested, we would love to have you. Just one song and one service. It's not a big commitment. Um, pop up choir. Yeah, exactly. Like a pop up choir. Um, we would um, be thinking of just like practicing on Sundays before service, maybe after service. So not a big commitment, guys. So join, join afterwards. Um, I'll be here like maybe for five minutes after. If you guys are interested, just walk up and we'll meet. So what's thank you. the song? Um, I, it's not chosen yet. It's between oh. carry your cross for me and cling to the cross for Lent. So. Lent hymns. Yeah, yeah. It's a Lent hymn. Are there other announcements? Things that are of vital that they get said out loud this morning. All right. Okay. Before we do have a hymn for during our time, we're going to do the thing we tried to do last time. We're going to divide everyone into groups. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. In your mind, how old are you? You don't have to tell me. I'll admit, I'm 40. So take the first number and the second number and add those together. If I were 39, it would be 12. Then add it together again, it'd be three. I'd be a three. Do you have your number? I'd, if you're 72, add seven and two together. Your number is a nine. Yeah? Keep adding until you get a single number. That's okay. Or pick the last number of the year of your age. But we're gonna get into small groups and we're gonna just share a little bit. We have some questions. They're simple questions, and we'll share a little bit. And then when you're done here and we're done and we've done some offering, ask each other what question you answered when you're down at, at um, coffee hour. But we're gonna mix it up a little bit. So I'm a four. Is anyone else a four? Is anyone else, a, is anyone a two? We have one, two. You're also a four. Turns out you're a four. Do we have a three? 
Nobody added their numbers together. Okay, pick the last. You are. What's the last number? Huh. Seven. Page. Come meet each other together. Go get to know each other. We'll give it to Kathy. Those whose last number is eight? Anyone? Is that just you? Find your people. I'll come back. Oh, there it is. Fives? Fives? Come hang out for a minute. Get to know each other. Sixes? I'm going to go away. Sevens? We're going to go back this way. One? You know what? If the sixes wanted to split up a little bit and join someone else, too, that's okay. I might have. I don't know. Is it Kathy's and mine? I have twos and ones. Oh, I think I sent sevens back towards um, Lorna.
should. friends. I know it's just going so good. I don't want to stop it, friends. I love this so much. I did start something. announcements and things. Hey, we got a certificate. So part of what we, the work we did, um, a little, we, we did some of the work and some um, financial giving for Lutheran Social Services as their support for refugee fam. I should have remembered, you've brought it up. I should have remembered. Um, and so as part of that, we get a plaque. Uh, the, the families that were supported with the six churches in the area, um, 
they got on their feet really fast. They got jobs. There was two, it was a three generation family. Um, they lived, were living in um, apartments that were not being used as part of Mar uh, Marquette University. And so the group still kind of exists and they didn't really use the money that was raised because they just didn't need to. Um, so the group, members of the group decided they want to do it again uh, to support another family. Um, some of what that involves, it doesn't involve looking for housing. It involves supporting um, for job hunting, for uh, care, helping um, get the kids settled in. And so there is some visiting and the, the folks who came back to tell stories of how the families were settling into the community were wonderful. So if that is something you are interested in doing, we can continue to be part of it, um, which is great. I think it's good work. Um, and it's, if you want to drive in, it's just at Marquette University. So it's a, it's a nice area. Um, so keep that in mind, uh, reach out to me, uh, and we'll get you in contact with the folks there and we can, we can do that. Um, so let us pray together our prayer of dedication. Holy God, we offer with gratitude those things which you have given to us, our time, time, and even our whole selves. Your abundance. Amen. Oh, we should have gotten our Super Bowl kids back. Does someone want to go get our Super Bowl, our kids, so we can get and find out how we did? Um, we should have done that. We got a little distracted. That's okay. We'll go back and do the song again. It's so good. But we'll start with our sending. Will you stand as you're able and in body, in heart for our benediction? And then we'll sing. We are marching again. And then we'll hear from our kids. Lord, send us out into our communities to love and serve you, transformed and inspired by God, our creator, Jesus, our brother, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, to go forth and love God's people. Let's do a little singing until they get here. Sorry. She's prepared to do other things. Chiefs got 15, the 49ers got 39, and the Packers got 65. The, <laughs> the winners are the 49ers. The total is 119. Stay if you're interested in a second one off on the choir. And if you're interested in the choir, guys. Choir people. 